Hi, I'm Malcolm Clemens Young, the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and welcome to Grace Cathedral's online forum, a series of conversations with religious thinkers about faith and the important issues of our day. Each year, the cathedral chooses a theme to reflect on, and in 2020, our theme is bridges. Throughout the year, we've been talking a lot about how we form connections with people, how we reach out across real or perceived divides that separate us. In this era of so-called fake news, what can we learn from the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard's idea of truth as subjectivity? Theologian, poet, social critic, Kierkegaard is sometimes called the first existentialist philosopher. Does 19th century philosophy have something to teach us today? My guest this evening is Joel Rasmussen, associate professor at the University of Oxford. His focus is on the interconnections between religion, philosophy, history, and literature in modern culture. And he is one of the editors of the 11 volumes of Kierkegaard's journals and notebooks. Joel, thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's so good to see you. I wish we could be there together in person, but I'm glad you were able to make it on this, on this, uh, on this Zoom meeting. You know, you um, Joel, virtually. Uh, yeah, right. I, um, you were like the number, my, my, the person who I most wanted to be my best friend for life when I met you. I just, when I met you, I was just like, this guy, and you know, the only thing that kept that from happening is that you live on a different continent than me. <laughs> Actually, you don't even live on a continent. <laughs> um, a big island right now, I'm on the same continent as you. That's are. good. That's good. I'm really glad. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's been so much that's been happening all around us in the news, um, you know, with the Black Lives Movement and with COVID-19 um, and just, you know, just in the political ether, um, there's so much happening. And I wonder um, about what connections you see with your life work and, and these big, huge social movements that are, are happening all around us. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to flummox me early in the conversation, I see. No, uh, basically we have we have a chance to like uh, to, to to like start with a bang. Yeah. In the old days, I, if we were in person, I would ask you more about your childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so big interconnections between um, things that are happening and that we're encountering, um, Black Lives Matter, um, alternative truths, etc. Um, my work is largely historical and philosophical theology. So any of the connections that I see, I'm drawing myself. It's not as though the figures that I'm, I'm looking at and writing on um, in, in particular have anything to say directly about it. And so many, if, I'm, if I'm writing an essay or a publication or teaching historically, philosophically on those, um, those figures, I'm not drawing those connections. So I mean, I'm drawing those connections. I'm drawing them um, with my family, with my friends, with my students, but not in a professional, I suppose, ac academic way. Right. But um, since you've, you've uh, um, structured our conversation around the question, what is true and, or what is truth and the significance of, uh, significance of Kierkegaard for understanding the world today, I think one of the very important things he offers in his thinking, and you've already you used his formulation, truth is subjectivity, is um, a distinction between truth conceived as objective truth um, and truth conceived as subjective, where the difference means an objective truth, which he never discounts um, as real, truths can still be objective, but when we're speaking of tr objective truths, we're making statements, we're predicating something about something other um, about a state of affairs that might have nothing to do with us. I mean, we actually try to e e erase ourselves from the picture as much as possible. Whereas when we ask questions about um, what, what is the significance of something for me? How do I relate to a state of affairs? That's what he means when he talks about truth as subjectivity. And he actually thinks that's essential truth. That's essential for how we live our own lives. Um, so with respect to um, conceiving alternative facts, I think a lot of people would say, um, um, this is Kelly on, Kellyanne Conway's remark, right? These are alternative facts mm -hmm. when she was being pressed on whether or not something is a truly an objective state of affairs. And someone might say, well, actually that kind of relativism is where uh, Kierkegaard gets us with this notion of truth as subjectivity. I think that's, that's a wrong understanding entirely. Um, he still has an underlying concern for 
um, predicating or giving a true, um, a, an objective account of a state of affairs. That's, that's always, there's the contextual, but what's more essential for how we exist, how we live, is how we relate ourselves to those, th those states of affairs. So it's very important still not to have um, a, a whole range of relativistic alternative facts to which we would relate, um, relate ourselves or choose not to or ignore, um, but to try to conform our behavior to how things are in actuality. I think that's an important baseline before we get too far down the conversation of tr in, in, into the conversation, conceiving truth as subjective and think that lands us in a kind of radical relativism. Right. I, I, I wonder if you can give people just a little bit of background on who Kierkegaard was and, you know, what was his setting and, um, you know, how, how, you know, what, what were some of the challenges of, 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 of his time? Yeah. Well, Kierkegaard, as you've already, I think, said in your introduction, was a, a 19th century Danish religious thinker. He, his favorite self-characterization was a Christian thinker and poet. Actually, people like people go back and forth. Is he a philosopher? Is he a theologian? Is he a novelist? Um, he's the first existentialist. All of this. His favorite, his own favorite characterization was a Christian thinker, and poet. So he's not concerned about placing himself in any one discipline that would be philosophy rather than theology or vice versa. In, in that sort of camp mentality, he lived from 1813 until 1855. So we're thinking that we're talking about the early part. Of, of the 19th century. Um, and we think about his life, sometimes it's helpful to think about some major points in, in his life. And three, three sort of, I'd say four big events characterize his life. His relationship with his father, um, his relationship with a young woman, Regina Olsen, which is an, was, he was betrothed to and then actually um, called off that engagement. Um, an event called the Corsair Affair, is, and, and then his late attack on Christendom. Um, he didn't travel a lot, so there aren't a lot, his life wasn't particularly eventful, but these four big things really do shape um, his life and help to understand his writings, but they're not really a Rosetta Stone to his writings either, but just to sort of give a character. Um, uh, yeah. His father yeah. cursed God on the heath, right? That was that um, seminal, and so, so, so what effect do you think that had just in, in terms of how he understood authority, understood the church, understood himself? Yeah, so may I, may I tell you a little bit more about that background? Yeah, story? I wanna hear all about I mean, it's, it. It's, it's, it. I think it's enormously important because um, his father was a shepherd boy initially, yeah. uh, on the heath, as you mentioned, in Jutland or Jutland, which is the part of, um, the part of Denmark that is um, contiguous with Europe um, and not just north of Germany. Um, and he was, he was a brilliant young boy, but he really disliked the life of, of, of being a shepherd boy. And he did curse God for his, his lot in life. Um, and as a, as a strong pietist, Lutheran pietist, um, um, he, this was a, very significant event in his life for which he felt guilty for the rest of his life for actually cursing God. I'm not, it's really hard for us, I think, in the 21st century, where we might actually take uh, swearing oaths somewhat more lightly than a, a pietist would have in the 19th century to think how seriously um, he, he would have taken that. And, and that, that really, um, really, in a way, scarred him for life. And he actually felt God had a kind of um, ironic way of punishing him, if you will, it was by calling um, a wealthy merchant uncle, uh, having a wealthy merchant uncle call him to, to Copenhagen, where he apprenticed him, and he showed incredible business acumen. I said already he was, he was very, very intelligent. Um, and he was able to become a successful merchant in his own right. Um, during the Napoleonic Wars, he invested his monies um, in, in, foreign, in foreign markets, and when when um, Nelson's fleet sailed in and did a surprise attack on the, on the Danish uh, Navy, um, the economy went into a tailspin and um, Mikael Pedersen, Kierkegaard, Søren's father, became the wealthiest man in Denmark basically overnight because, his, because all his, his um, investments were overseas. So he's an outsider 
to within his cultural capital and yet able to provide his son Surin with all the benefits of, of the very best education, um, cultural advantages and everything. And, and Surin Kierkegaard himself sees himself as both um, an outsider and an and an and well, an outsider for life, really, but also moving within the cultural center and in with the the tastemakers of the time, but always still marked by this really peasant um, um, piety of his father. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and how now tell us a little bit about that second um, milestone, the Regina um, Olson story. Um, you know, you, you're so close to the journals, and so you'll, you'll have that material kind of um, quick at hand. But, you know, what was the story there? You know, why ever did he break off that engagement? We don't really know fully. Um, we, because of course we all, we, we probably all tell ourselves different stories and there are some different versions in his journals and stories about the, the, the relationship, um, even in its own time uh, accounts that other people would have given to each other. Um, but it's pr probably has again, something to do with his own inner melancholy. He was, he's regarded often as the melancholy Dane. He has a kind of brooding temperament, always feeling like an outsider. Um, he becomes engaged to Regina, who's 10 years his junior when he's about 20. Well, they, they break it off when he's 28 and she's 18. Um, part of it has to do with he, her own, his own sense that she lives immediately. She enjoys life in its immediacy. And he's a brooding figure um, with whom for whom it might have actually been very challenging to 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 live with, and he might well be right about that. Actually, if someone is a kind of buoyant spirit and always been uh, um, and and living with someone who thinks of his sorrow as his castle, to use one of his his phrases. But there's also the situation that he he had a view of marriage that um, one would share with one's partner. You would invite them into a complete knowledge of each other's interior lives, which in some ways is, is um, probably impossible totally, but it's still a kind of commitment. And he would have had to share some of the maybe darker secrets of his family with her. Um, his father had recently died, so he didn't want to, um, he wouldn't have wished to introduce her to perhaps the fact that um, when his first wife died, he remarried um, within the year, so within the period of mourning, and he remarried the housekeeper um, who was pregnant with Surin's older brother. And of course, this is also a kind of, you know, pregnancy out of wedlock, even if you're able to do something about it through marriage, is still a kind of, a, a kind of scandal there. And he would have had to share that with her. And this would have seen a kind of impiety towards his father, perhaps. And that together with the brooding spirit um, and I just decided I, he had to call it off. I, I love that because I've never thought of that part of it. And even that just the, that, that she was at the aesthetic level. It's almost like, so when he's writing about the aesthetic and the ethical and religiousness A and religiousness B, I just never thought of like her fitting into that, that like typology before. Um, and it's just like, it's too much to explain now, but I, it, I, yeah. I, the, the stages of, of, of you know, yeah, yeah, yes, I do. I do see what you're, what you're saying. So, I mean, it, it, he's also about to write a volume entitled Either Or, um, which is this, or it's two volumes actually, but a work um, called, entitled Either Or, where he does develop um, the categories of the aesthetic and the ethical and um, implicitly also the religious, these famous stages on life's way that he um, Talking about this. Sorry, I realize my eyes are probably all to the side, so everyone's wondering why I'm looking at your picture rather than the camera. I'm not really used to this. Um, I lined this, up your computer. picture right with the camera on my computer. <laughs> oh, I don't even. I, I don't even know how to do that. I'm afraid. Um, so, but he develops the, the the immediate aesthetic and the reflective aesthetic in there. And yeah, she, although it, it, the typology doesn't work entirely with her because the representative of the immediate immediate aesthetic is. Um, Don Giovanni, uh, so the, a, a seducer, certainly not a Regina, but 
li living in immediate categories, living for the enjoyment of life fully in the moment, rather than the reflective aesthete who's living for um, ways of making sure life remains interesting. Fending off boredom is, is, the, is the key to being a reflective aesthete. That's one of my favorite things in Kierkegaard, by the way, is this idea of interesting. Like, I, I just, you know, it, um, you know, he sets it off against, you know, other ways of being, but there, it, it, it's also about communication, too, that, that there are ways of communicating in a more compelling way um, that, that involve the interesting and what makes something interesting. <laughs> I think about that all the time. Yeah. Like, I'd rather my preachers at the cathedral were interesting than write all the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's Emerson's notion of be not spectral, right? Yes, exactly. When, like when you're so preaching, so be not spectral. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the interesting becomes an enormously important category in um, romantic um, right. thinking. Um, um, and in fact, a figure who is actually very important in Kierkegaard's, Kierkegaard's own um, his doctor is magister thesis, which actually becomes a doctorate. Um, is Friedrich Schlegel, who says the, the the key to understanding classical aesthetics is understanding that the, the aesthetic category is always concerned with the beautiful, and in modernity, the modern aesthetic is a concern with the interesting. Um, so that does become very and as he as Kierkegaard through either or um, explores that category. He writes one of the one of the es essays in the first volume of either or is called the rotation of crops. Do you remember that essay? I, totally do. I remember it completely. So the key to fending off boredom, which is really the, the the worst thing for the aesthete, is to make sure you change up you change up life. You you know find ways of shaking the cobwebs off of things. The rotation of crops. He realizes he says this is a this is a metaphor I take from agriculture, but we can employ it on in in daily life. You know when you read a book. Confound the author's expectations by starting in the middle. If you go, if you go to, if you take someone to the symphony, um, you, you, you take. Uh, oh, it's all, always gendered and sexist from from a twenty first perspective, sensory yeah. perspective. But if you take a young lady to the symphony, um, say, let's let's catch the carriage right after the overture. You've inf enjoyed the best part, the anticipation. It's it's only downhill from from here, and in a way, this also becomes one of the, the downfall of um, the romantic aesthetic more generally, I think, here who are things, because um, life is lived in, in, primarily in anticipation of enjoyment rather than enjoyment. And so everything gets reflected through the imagination, how to keep things interesting. And actuality, live, the daily life we all have to live um, is, is often going to be a letdown you know, compared to, and, and in, we face this, you know, in, in the age of ro romanticism, they had the novel from which we get the word rom romanticism, right? With the roman. Um, mm -hmm. um, in our age, we have, we have, um, we have film, we have Netflix, we have um, Instagram, Instagram, etc. cetera, <laughs> um, all, all sorts of other ways just to, to maintain, but, but it's, does it, we're fending off we're having to deal with our actuality in many ways, but does it sustain us? How, how long can we scroll before we realize actually we're kind of in despair? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love the idea that, of Instagram as being that you know, constant, constant longing and desire for, for the interesting, for what's new, for what you've never seen before. And, and you know, what's new now in three days is going to be completely different. Um, but I, I love this way of thinking about Kierkegaard in terms of these th like major milestones. And the Corsair affair is is another. You're yeah. right. It's just like the seminal moment in his life, which um, really changed you know how everything went afterwards. And maybe you can t talk a little bit about about that. I, I, I... yeah, the Corsair affair is um, uh, probably about we're about five or six years on now. And by the way. Everything's quite compressed in Kierkegaard's life. He only lives to four, 43 years old, and most of his writings, and it's a vast literary output. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Danish uh, critical edition, including the commentary, so that's not entirely fair, is 55 volumes, and most of that was writ written within a 14-year period. Um, so it's, it, it's amazing. But everything's quite compressed. He's already established himself within five years as really um, the most exceptional 
literary, intellectual, philosophical, theological figure on the Danish scene, on the Danish stage, which is really within the larger European context, a fairly small stage, um, but, it, but nonetheless, it, within a short uh, span of time, he is the, the figure. Um, and there's this, a magazine called The Corsair um, that is a literary, but also satirical magazine. And they publish regularly um, sort of takedowns of various figures. I mean, uh, um, take, taking the, taking the, taking the mickey um, yeah. uh, out of a lot of the, the prominent figures. Um, and Kierkegaard is re really offended by the, the, the level of the discourse in, in, the, in, in the Corsair. Um, he knows everyone reads it, but polite society doesn't ad admit that they read it. Um, and he's willing to say, um, when they say of him, um, well, of one of his pseudonyms, we haven't really talked about the pseudonymous authorship, right. when they say of one of his pseudonyms, um, that, and it's actually of, of, um, of um, Victor Eremita, um, that, that you know, we, they celebrate the immortal Victor Eremita. They have only good things to say about it. And by this time, people know that Søren Kierkegaard is the author of these pseudonymous writings, over 10 different pseudonyms um, he's publishing under. Um, and they, they celebrate the author of this. And he says, this, this is not, not really um, the kind of praise a, a figure would long for. It's far better, far better to be taken down. And they, so they let him have it, actually, mm -hmm. for being critical of them praising him. And they publish for, for months on end um, caricatures of him. So if anyone's seen a caricature of Kierkegaard, it's often from the Corsair. And they'll, they'll show him walking through Copenhagen because he was... He was um, an, a peripatetic thinker who would often go what he take what he called his people baths during the day. He'd go out and and have conversations with people, um, and he could he was a conversationalist who was able to mix well with just about anyone, evidently. Um, so he would be seen in the street, and, but he, th these caricatures would portray him with a cane and a hunched back. He wasn't an old man, but he didn't have a good good posture, evidently. His uh, his trouser legs would often be depicted of, of different lengths and too high, and he'd have these pencil legs. On, in one image, you know, you've got landmarks of, of Copenhagen surrounding him with him in the middle with his chest held up high like the world surround, uh, revolves around Sir and Kierkegaard. In another, um, he's riding poor. We, we take it it's Regina because this broken engagement is well known within a small society. He's, he's riding her like a horse, so it's really unfair to her as well. Um, and this this um, ruins his, his what his, the life he was accustomed to, yeah. because now where only the reading public, where, where previously only the reading public um, knew who Søren Kierkegaard was, now the people in the street, the kids in the street, yeah. were would um, would run right. after him to see whether he resembled the, and he couldn't take his people baths anymore, and made it. But he had also recently published. The concluding unscientific postscript to philosophical fragments, probably his most philosophical work, from which the the um, the line you quote at the beginning, "Subjectivity is truth, and truth is subjectivity," comes, and it's con the concluding unscientific postscript for a vari variety of reasons. But the concluding part of the title um, was because he actually envisioned ending his writing, his um, authorship with this and taking a living as a minister um, mm -hmm. out, outside, outside of Copenhagen, actually. But now he felt um, that it would actually be unethical to leave because it would look like the Corsair had run him out of town. Um, and it would have, it, so on, princi on principled grounds, he stays, and stays on in Copenhagen, doesn't take that living as a minister, and continues, continues his writing of what is sometimes called the second authorship where he more frequently writes under his own name rather than the pseudonyms. He had always written also under his own name alongside, and every time he published one of the pseudonymous works, so I've, I've spoken of either or on what early writing and um, postscript, concluding on scientific postscript, the, the later writing, but between there we also have title, famous titles really, uh, yeah. Fear and Trembling, 
repetition, the concept of anxiety, um, philosophical fragments, um, and then works of love comes out in 1846 under his own name. The entire time he also publishes writings under his own name that, that he calls upbuilding discourses or edifying discourses. Um, right. But he observes that what, what he offers with one hand, uh, it, 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 the edifying discourses with the one hand and the aesthetic writings, the, the more novelistic, uh, ironic, humoristic writings with the other, the public always wants, always wants only what's the, uh, the, the, um, the ironic literary works and doesn't pay enough attention to the edifying works. After the Corsair Affair, he largely publishes um, in, the, in the mode of edifying writings. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it's, it, it's, it's um, I, I, some of those work so well with me. I mean, I, st I still have, you know, Philosophical Fragments, I think is one of my favorite books of all time. I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. yeah. I, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's so short. And there's, there's so many times I just, I kind of want to get to the heart of something. It, it helps me to do that. Um, yeah. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just like his relation to just the established church and just, just how that was. I mean, you, you mentioned him, his interest in, in being ordained and in serving in a, in a, a local parish church. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about just like what he wrote about the church and just that, that seems like it may be the last part of his, you know, autobiography or his biography. Yeah. Yeah, he has a very, very complicated relationship to the, the established church. Um, he attends various churches um, in Copenhagen faithfully. He thinks of the primate of, of um, Denmark, um, Bishop Minster, um, as his father's pastor, and it would have been the person who had catechized and confirmed him, uh, Sir, and himself. I believe, um, and yet he represented the, the established state church, and he was very much anti-Erastian, to use a kind of technical theological word, um, where the church and the state are in a kind of collusion, and the church is effectively a department of, of the state, um, and he, he thinks this is a, a compromise of the gospel with, with um, with culture, with the established order, but when the church the church is called to be um, um, a, a witness to the truth in any culture or established order, not to conform itself to that established order, or to be in the world but not of the world, he takes that he takes that very very seriously, and he doesn't think that the, the cultured denizens of of Copenhagen take that anywhere near seriously enough because they think. Basically, the church, the, the, the church, the established church, is the church victorious. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, nev it's no longer the church militant, which is, a, again, a problematic term in, in, in the 21st century, but the, the church that sees itself as in the world, but not of the world. Yeah. Um, the church that's, instead of the church that's engaged in the struggle, the church that's triumphed in the struggle. In, yeah. yeah. So in a, in a context where the church is viewed as triumphant within the culture, the culture itself is seen as Christian. It's seen as Christendom, which is the, the official self-understanding, really, of the, of the Danish church in, in the era. Um, and he thinks this is obviously discontinuous with the representative representations that we have in the New Testament of what the church is supposed to look like in the world. Yeah. So his way of re resisting the notion that a person is Christian by virtue of being Danish. If just by virtue of being Danish, you are Christian. And, and, if, and he says in postscript, uh, his pseudonym, Johannes Climacus, about which we can talk more if you like later. Um, the, the, the pseudonym says, if someone ever comes to think very earnestly about their own relationship to God in and through Christ, their Christian existence, and wonders, am I truly a Christian? Am I really a Christian? Um, and makes the mistake of saying to someone else, in this case, it's, um, it's his, his partner, his wife, um, I'm really doubting whether I'm truly a Christian or not. And she, and she, and she says to him, well, of course you're Christian, you're Danish. Um, 
and look at the map. It says right here, it's the Christian land. And this, this very notion is completely discontinuous, he thinks, with, with yeah, well, it's impossible to be, to be on the way to becoming a Christian or to focus on becoming a Christian if you already are one. And, and I think a lot of it just has to do with just him. I think he, 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 he sees people thinking that they understand what it means to be a Christian. Well, being Christian, it means being Danish. I was baptized as a yeah. and, and And that's part of it, too. And I, I, that, that, that's where I think, for me, the pseudonymous strategy, indirect speech, indirect communications, all that comes in, in, into play there. Later, still, in about 1849 or 18, and 1850, um, he publishes two works um, under, the, under the titles The Sickness Unto Death and Practicing Christianity. And there he uses still another pseudonym, Anticlimachus. Um, but in the, in, in the in introductory pages of that work, he s says he takes a, as the task under this pseudonym to introduce Christianity into Christendom. The introduction of Christianity into Christendom. It's a paradoxical formulation. He uses all sorts of paradoxical formulations in his authorship. But that's a, a, a delightful one in some ways, but also a very challenging way one in others. In a context such as 1850s Denmark, in where everyone assumes they're Christian, it's very difficult to share with someone what Christianity really is, because everyone already has sort of assumptions that they haven't really necessarily interrogated, but they're so familiar with it, they can't actually, they don't actually spend any time with it. They get on, they get busy with other things because that's already established. We've already done that. We're tr it's the church triumphant rather than achieving. So, so a missionary, as if, if one is called to be a missionary, has a much um, simpler task, introducing Christianity into a land where no one's ever even heard of it because you don't have, there aren't the misunderstandings right. already. Whereas he thinks here in, in Denmark, and we might say more generally in, in, a, in a church culture or Christendom, maybe even post-Christendom, if we still think, yeah, we know, we know what it was that we're over. Right. Um, um, it's, it's much harder because first of all, you have to take something away. So this is why irony becomes, for, this is Socratic irony it becomes very, very important, it remains very important, but he uses it for, for um, Ex ex expressly Christian purposes. You have to take a misunderstanding away from people before you can actually give something to them. In Christendom, people are, are basically starving because they're choking on the food they're trying to eat. You've got to take <laughs> it away from them in order to, to, to nourish them with, with the, the, the food of the gospel, as it were. In your book, you have a, you have a quote from, 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 of, of this, this summarized just that. This, this is Joel's book, by the way. And Joel, you always um, were sad that it, it was so expensive. But man, yeah. this is one of the best deals of my life. Oh. Um, I was reading your book. I actually I was at a conference, and they're, they're, it, we're working on our, our mission statement. And my mission statement is completely from Joel Rasmus and oh. Irony and Witness. But yeah. here's, the, here's the quote. He said, um, uh, when this is the case, the art of being able to communicate eventually becomes the art of being able to take away or trick something away from someone. This seems very strange and very ironic, and yet I believe I have succeeded in expressing exactly what I mean. <laughs> That's from page 104. You know, one of the things I love about your, your career since, we, um, since our paths have diverged, you know, I, I wrote um, a... a uh, one of my general exams, my modern general exam was on Kierkegaard. Yes. Um, and yeah, so I, and I love that material. And I, you know, I was so jealous when you went to, to Denmark and learned Danish, but Heidi would have none of that. <laughs> but um, you've gotten so close to, the, to, to Kierkegaard's journals. And all I have is that like little Harper torch book version of um, yeah. the journals, like it's kind of like best of. Um, you know, but what was it like going through the, the materials in the journals and just, you know, how did that kind of change your, your, your impression of Kierkegaard and his thought in, in time, et cetera? Well, we've only recently finished. I'm, I mean, I'm a member of a team um, and not even the most important member of the team at that. Um, the general editor is uh, Bruce Kiermsey. Um, who's now Sir Bruce Kiermsey. He's been knighted the, with the Order of the Dannebrog, which is another delicious irony because um, Kierkegaard himself often uh, uh, criticized the fact that Minster and Martinson, these people he was often criticized, were, you know, preaching with their medals on their, on their, on their preaching gowns. Um, 
Um, and for, for Bruce's work on Kierkegaard's writings, he's himself been knighted. Um, <laughs> um, but, but, it, but it's a great honor. And I'm just happy to have been part of the team that worked with Sir Bruce uh, on this. And getting so close to the text work that you know, we've been working on since, well, the, the team was assembled in 2007, I think. I came a, a few years later when I was, I was invited on, I think, 2009. Um, and we've only finished this year. So yeah. 10 years, it's been painstaking working through what, what is 11 volumes in the, in the English. Um, it felt like every single time the term was finished and I was finished teaching, there, there the, the journals were waiting for me to, to work on. Um, and I've both loved it, but also felt that it, um, it will be good in, eventually to turn to a different kind of, of scholarship. So finishing, it's very bittersweet. We were supposed to mark the completion this um, on Kierkegaard's birthday, oh, yeah. uh, May, May 5th. Yeah, yeah, May 5th, 2020. And there was, um, um, there was going to be um, a celebration of the completion at the Danish Embassy in Washington, D.C., oh. sponsored by Princeton University Press and the, and the University of Copenhagen and, and, and the, um, the Embassy. But because of the pandemic, that had to be called off, hopefully postponed only, but um, it, it, it was a non-event. But still, so completing it has been bittersweet because I do feel like um, working with his journals is a kind of insight into his own daily writing practices. Almost, actually very, very much like um, the spiritual journal tradition that you've worked on. Mark. Exactly. I, I kept thinking about, you know, I've read Bronson Alcott's journals, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, all the early Puritans. You know, what was the tradition of journal writing um, like in, in, in Denmark? In, in what ways did, was he uh, unique? In what ways was, were, were the things that he did pretty standard for other journal writers? Um, <sighs> The, the practice of, of, of writing in a, in a daily way, I think, is pretty, is pretty standard. And it was, it's usually devotional, although sometimes he's talking about um, his reading of contemporary German philosophy. Sometimes he's writing about um, uh, middle-aged troubadour romances. It's fantastic. I mean, that's one of the most enjoyable things I was doing translating last year, was translating this troubadour romance, just far-fetched something. It's, I've never come across anything like this before. And he had spent the time to sort of annotate his own readings. And I don't think that's in a typical spiritual journal. Um, so, um, and he's also working through his ideas that then many of which appear in his, in his published writings. Um, and he's organizing the journals in a way that I think probably most don't. Um, because most people, don't anticipate that they're preparing their journals for publication someday. And he increasingly became aware that these journals would be read um, by, by people who came after him, as, and he was correct about that. So he's organizing, he's, he's labeling them um, a, a, a NB123 and so forth, and, and they're just very well organized. We know primarily pretty much when each one starts and begins and we can coordinate it to the writings he's working on for publication. So he's, all, he's perhaps more conscious of the fact that there will be a readership for these journals than most um, spiritual journalists are, I think. Have you kept a, a journal yourself just to kind of see what that was like? Or, you know, what, what is your history, your personal history of journal writing? Um, you might be surprised. No, I'm very indolent. Um, <laughs> I have tried and I've never been successful at it. Uh, I think the way we'd have to work out what I'm doing on a daily basis is by reading my emails to students and colleagues on a daily basis. Um, no, I, 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 maybe, maybe I will, but that has not been something I've, I've done. Exactly. How about you, How about you Malcolm? If I'm not writing a sermon, I have, if I'm not writing sermons, I have to be writing something else. So the most documented period of my life was when we were closest. 
So yeah. when I was taking you know, classes at HDS and doing the doctoral work, I wasn't writing as many sermons. And so I did write a lot of journal. And you know, part of it was I was writing about a person's journals. And so I, I needed, to, I wanted to know what it was like for me. Do you know what I mean? In terms of like, what would I choose to include? What would I, like, what would be the rules of writing that journal? Um, so, so, so it had that kind of practical element to it too. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, you know, one of my favorite things about you, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to like your future because I, I know getting done with the, the journals, the Kierkegaard's journals is, is you're right. I'm, I'm glad because it'll liberate you to do other things. Um, but, you know, I, I, I always think of the American pragmatist when I think of your thought. And, and I wonder if you can just talk about just, you know, Charles Sanders Peirce and William James and John Dewey and, and the whole lot. I mean, it, it, was that just like something that you were interested in as a young person and it, it doesn't have a continuing effect on you or, or, it, or you, know, what, you know, what is American pragmatism and then and, and, and what continuing role has it had in your life, if any? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there, Malcolm. <laughs> um, yeah, I know it. <laughs> What is American pragmatism? Uh, well, it's, it's a, a different tradition entirely in, in important respects from what we've been discussing. Um, but I always go to Peirce's, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce's sort of maxim that uh, when, we, when we consider any, and I won't quote this, the pragmatistic ma maxim exactly, and you probably can where, where I'm grappling for it right now. Um, but we, when we cons whatever we're considering, when we, th when we think about what difference it makes to conceive it one way rather than another, if we want to know what something means, we think of what practical difference it makes to conceive it some way rather than another. And the differences it makes is the meaning it has for us, effectively. Exactly. Um, so he, for, for Peirce, it's very much a way of getting at the meaning of an idea or a thing which we always understand in terms of ideas. Um, James, William James, um, is often said to, and criticized, said to make this a, a theory of truth rather than a theory of meaning. Um, so pushing, pushing the bounds of what we can do with that maxim. Um, but what's, a most imp what's most important about tradition for me is it's a, another form of philosophy like Kierkegaard's that's concerned about the fruits of one's thinking rather more than the roots of one's thinking. By their what, fruits, what, you shall know them. By, your, by their fruits, you shall know them. What difference does it make to think a certain way, to, to act a certain way, to believe something? It, it, how does it shape one's life? And I think the pragmatists have that in common with Kierkegaard. And they have remained um, important to me. Um, I was able to work with a, a colleague named Martin Halliwell at the University of Leicester on a book we published called The, the Transatlantic Conversation on um, prag pragmatism um, and pragmatism, pluralism in the philosophy of religion, which marked the, um, the, cent the centenary really of um, William James's Oxford lectures that he gave, which became a pluralistic universe yeah. um, that he published, that he was actually invited to do, interestingly, um, to offer these lectures at Harris Manchester College, oh, that's great. Where, yeah. where my colleague Jane Shaw, your right. predecessor, Grace Cathedral, is now the, the, the head of house. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a great connection. And I think of um, just uh, we, uh, I, I go by the Swedenborgian church every day that has William James's um, dining room table and dining room table sets. So I do think of, you know, in his idea of just like the, the cash value of an idea, like you know, how does, you know, in, in Peirce's idea of just like this community of inquirers too, I just think is, is, is such an interesting idea too. Of, yeah. of truth not being something that's like inherent in the world, but it's, it's part of a, a community's experience of that world. Yeah. That's right. So it also has, it's, it's social and it has to do with how we relate to each other as well as to the truth, back to our notion of the subjective dimension of truth. It's how we relate to each other as well as to an objective state of affairs. Yeah. You know, you talked a little bit about just that transatlantic conversation. I wonder if you can, um, you've been um, working in, um, in Oxford for, for a while. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the difference between the English system and the American system and, and just, you know, what American universities may have to learn from, from um, schools in the UK. 
Um, yeah, that's that's hard. Well, I, I don't have a lot of experience with the English system more generally. I teach at one university and I um, so, sort of parachuted in rather than coming through, as you know, I, I was a, a student. We sent you there as an advanced, as the advanced paratroopers. <laughs> and at, at Oxford is a kind of, a, it's, it's, in many ways it's kind of, and unfortunately in some ways too, rarefied air. We have the advantage of using the tutorial system. It would be wonderful if others, other universities could learn from, from it, but it, I think the, the, the wave of the future is probably more uh, teaching online like this, um, lectures to large groups of people rather than sitting in a room with one or two students working each week with the students. I mean, the way we, we do it is the, the student writes an essay each week and then I sit with that student for an hour each week. And this office hours, as we would, might call it in an American university, is with each student individual or in, in tutorial pairs, as we call them, um, for an hour working through their essays. And I just don't see that um, the economics of that is, in, is in, in, the, in the cards for American universities, as it, it's, it's not for most British universities either. Um, and we are fighting very hard to retain it in Oxford, actually, because it just is, it's what makes Oxford, Oxford. Um, right. What are some of the benefits that, of that approach for a student? Like how, how, you know, how does that serve the student well in terms of their intellectual development? Yeah. I like to think that it enables formation. It really is. It's, it's, we have a pastoral dimension as tutors, and it's called a pastoral dimension. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a clerical pastoral dimension, but it is a, 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 tutors have the role of care of souls, really, and formation of these young minds, helping them to do their best work, helping them to stand on their own, which is wonderful in my own line of work, because that even is a Kierkegaardian notion. The highest relation any one human being can have to another is to help him or her stand on her own. Um, this is, and this is, he thinks is also Socratic. What I, what I do in my conversations with my students and in my best conversations with friends and colleagues is the, the Socratic role of the midwife, help them to give birth to their own best thinking, their own best action, their own best living, their own human flourishing. Um, and by, by working, by asking questions that lead out further thinking based on, on the essays that they've worked hard to research and write through, through, the, through the week, um, sometimes that really does happen. I mean, it actually happens more frequently than I would have uh, dared to hope, I think, which means this, the system itself is, really works well because I can't credit it to myself. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. And, uh, you know, I think of Dick Niebuhr and Gordon Kaufman and, um, you know, David Lambert. I mean, there were a lot of teachers that you and I had who really took time with Sarah Coakley, yeah. you know, who really took time with us. And, and I just remember sitting in that old library in their, in their little offices and, 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 and how important that was for my formation too. Um, you know, uh, you, you, as you like look back at the American church scene now, you know, like how does it look different to you now than say, you know, how things looked in say 1997? You know, uh, what are you seeing as some important trends in the church and, and how does it look to you after, uh, after this time away? Hmm. I, I'm clearly struggling to answer the question, I'll be yeah. honest. Um, my familiarity with the American church scene is um, as the husband of a congregationalist minister in my adult life. Um, and, and Tanya, my wife, serves a congregational church here in New Hampshire, where I am during the pandemic. Um, and each congregation has its own distinctive character. Um, 
but I would say generally, even since 1997, where, when there were already concerns about this, um, the church is very much having to find ways of, I, I don't like to use the term, but market itself in, in a very competitive marketplace um, where it, it's vying for the attention, the commitment of people. This was already the case in 1997. Um, and it's even more so now. And while Zoom Church and its various um, variations that people are using right now um, is a, a, a real uh, lifesaver right now, I also fear that people will be get used to used to it and not come back. And I know that's one of Tanya's fears. I don't know what you think. Um, it might be very different to be in a cathedral setting than in a, in a, in a local parish. Um, well, when, I, I, um, when everything first happened, our vice dean is um, Ellen Clark King, and she's actually going to be the dean of um, King's College London. Um, so she just just got that appointment. We just announced exactly. it. She's wonderful. But you know, as soon as COVID hit, the two of us had a conversation. We asked, it, are, are people going to not come to church as much because they realize how easy it is just to you know, make a cup of coffee and sit on the dining room table and watch it on your screen? Or are people going to really appreciate being together because it, it, we, see, we see value in it in a way that we just didn't before? Yeah. Um, and and it, it's hard to know, um, you know what direction it's going to go in. You know, it really is. Um, it's clearly the case that for, for different people, it will go in both of those directions, right? Uh, there, there are people that, anecdotally I hear, really enjoy it. They like being able to sleep in and come to Zoom church in the pajamas with the coffee. But there are others um, really clamoring in, in Tanya's congregation um, to, to meet again in the meeting house because they, they miss that. And it's, it's the, the congregation has de determined now that it's really far too early for that and will carry on with the Zoom church for the, for the, for the summer anyway. Yeah, it's, a, it's so tough. I mean, if you had told me in January that our Sunday attendance would be like triple what it was in, um, in, in, in five months, I would never have believed it. And if you told me that, um, that the churches would be closed and empty you know, five months later, I, I wouldn't have believed it. I mean, it's just, it is such a massive change. Um, and it's, it's very hard to understand, except to think, be constantly thinking like, you know, how can we, how can we um, take advantage of whatever opportunities there are and try to minimize the damage of, of, of everything else? Yeah. Um, but because it could be an advantage to it. And also even from, to bring it back to the Kierkegaardian discussion, from a Kierkegaardian perspective, that the, the church will need to rethink what it means to be a church. It can't just assume that it's part of the culture. It's just part of people's daily habit. I mean, habituation is very important too, but it, it's an opportunity for people to take stock. And if people are just going through the motions, that's not at all what um, Christianity um, tells us it is. Yeah. And that's, it really gets down to that. Cause I mean, we're basically having conversations about like, what is communion? Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, the, the, the bishops and the presiding bishop are saying, you cannot do this at home. And if whatever you're doing at home, it's not real, uh, you know, but by the same token, we spent the last 30 years or 40 years telling people that if you don't have church communion in church on Sunday, then it's, it's not that it's not real, but it, you know, it, it, it you know, we, we've really emphasized communion and now, all of a sudden it's just taken away and yeah no it, it's huge and and that ecclesially um the churches run the spectrum don't they so i mean a very sacramental understanding of of the eucharist um is really challenged by a pandemic it's, it's clear um whereas if one has a, a notion where everyone can get their grape juice and sip some bread and do it, right. um, 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 this is um, this is a, it's called a sacrament sh still, but the conception of the sacrament as a memorial feast is um, it's it's just memorial. It's an outer symbol of an inner. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Then yeah. then then it's, it's not a problem, but um, th that might not really be the full sacramental conception of the Eucharist anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, completely.
Um, so I, 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 like, I want to hear so much about some of the projects that you're working on now. Now that we can lay those journals to rest, I can't wait to see them in print. I, 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 I'm looking forward to checking them out of the library. Um, so, yeah, so, don't um, they're far too expensive. Okay, they're far too expensive. I'm still trying to buy Thoreau's journals. I have the, the Xerox versions of them. I'm gradually replacing yeah. them with the bound versions. Yeah. So it will be a while before I get to Kierkegaard's journals. But um, what are other things are you researching and thinking about and working on? Um, what are you writing these days? Um, I'm, I'm writing notes in the margins of students' work mostly. Yeah. Um, but, but Friday of this week, our term comes to an end. And then we have an examination period, for which will be a, about a month, actually. of marking. And then I will turn once again to um, a, something I'm been working on for a long time and it's been languishing. I'm struggling a bit, but it's called Christianity and the Cultures of Modernity from Westphalia to the Great War. Uh, so 1648 to 1914. And it's an attempt to move from a more specifically fo works focused on figures and their ideas, philosophical theology, um, to larger themes, not to be world historical exactly, yeah. um, but just to, just to challenge myself now, and it's proved to be much more of a challenge than I even anticipated. I'm trying to do a history of, of Christianity and modernity, um, looking at both the vertical dimension, as um, Yaroslav Pelikan will talk it, so the development of doctrine and the ways that, the ways that um, enlightened philosophy, industrialization, um, yeah. um, ur urbanization, yeah, natural scientific challenges, change the way Christians have conceived how to understand their doctrines, that vertical, but also horizontal, uh, the horizontal dimension, looking at Christian conversations with other spheres of life entirely and other religious traditions as well. Um, and it's, it was, it's probably, I've bitten off more than I can chew, I'm sure of it, Malcolm. Uh, I think but, it's going to be. Someday I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it so much, Joel. I, I, but between irony and witness was I, I, I loved it. I loved hearing your voice, um, and I love your you know your interest in the imagination and poetics and the aesthetic. Um, and you know I, I I was reading Schopenhauer for a sermon this last week, and you know there's there's ways. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, he's just kind of anticipating Darwinian evolution in his yeah. own way. Yeah. So, so I can imagine a, a work that's focused on those general ideas rather than the particular exponents of those ideas. You know, I, um, I, I, as I see from your perspective, I wonder what your, um, by the way, I've got a very special guest who would like to say, say hello to you. <laughs> yeah, you better hurry up. It's on, you're on TV. Uh, there's oh, Heidi. Goodness. Hello, Heidi. She said she absolutely had to say hello to you, otherwise it wouldn't be. Yeah. Like, but I, I wonder what um, what's giving you hope these days? What signs of hope are you seeing in, in society? What are what, what are you what are you what are some things that you're noticing about the world around you? Yeah. Well, strange as it may seem in some ways, I think the Black Lives Matter movement. Is in, is in fact an enormously hopeful moment in society. Um, I'm not, not the best person to speak to this at all, but um, the fact that we, it's, it's a time of consciousness raising, just like we might have assumed, like the church might have assumed um, it, had, it was a church triumphant. I think a lot of people in the, a lot of white people in the 1980s and 1990s assumed racism had been addressed in the in the civil rights movement of, of the of the 60s largely um, clearly it wasn't so this kind of uh, um, reckoning um, provides hope that we can actually find ways to address and redress systemic problems that are at the at the foundation not, uh, certainly of of this country but um, also, we're seeing now with the protests in, in London and Paris, um, the systemic throughout Europe, and that um, yeah, whiteness is a problem. The conception right. of white, whiteness is a problem. And, and I'm hopeful that we can be transformed by... You know, one of the things we didn't get the opportunity to speak about with, in connection with subjectivity is truth. Here, who was, uh, or uh, Johannes Klamaka says, is there, is there still a more intensive 
um, way of putting this. Yes, subjectivity is untruth um, as well. Subjectivity is truth when we rightly relate to th those things that are the most important to us. And God as subject, he says in that same section, can only be related to subjectively because God is subject. We cannot have an objective relationship to something that is no object in the world. But our relationship to that is always also corrupted. So the recognition that our subjectivity is untruth, said doctrinally, is sinful, that re the recognition is, is salutary. So we can actually have, take hope from confessing our brokenness, our, our, the ways in which we are in untruth. Yeah, and I especially think of just that, that American tradition again. It's just like behind that American pragmatism is this idea that of, of, of an equality of persons that we have not realized in our society. It's like this promise to treat people equally, to regard yeah. people as having equal dignity. And we just, we have not at all lived into that promise. And yeah. this is a reminder of just how, you know, how much we need to make, make society different to, so that we can, we can be true to that promise. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing objectively true about the promise. The promise is an ideal yeah. to, be, to be enacted, and, but we can only enact that ideal through a, an earnest, subjective relationship to it that doesn't take it for granted, cannot take it as having been established already. It's always a project. Right. So, so, and, that, and that gives hope because it, that too keeps life interesting. Um, yeah, exactly. But it also closes, it closes to what is, is, would be faithful if we could do it. In a way, it's like the, an analogy is just um, like th th that an analogy between the Christendom, just like that we, we that we need to become Christians, and it, you know, and we're not going to solve our race problems by denying that we have race problems, and we're not going to solve our religious problems by um, denying that we have religious problems. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. there, there, there's there's definitely um, uh, a parallel. But I, I can't believe it because I still have a zillion questions and some of our, our, our audience's questions too, but they, they, they tech, the messages didn't get through from Rebecca. Oh, no. but I'll ask her to send those questions to you um, so that you'll know what questions we had from our audience because um, there's some very good ones. Almost in, in, invariably, the audience questions are, are by far the best, but they just, we had a lot of technological problems that you just didn't see that were behind the scenes. Yeah. So we weren't able to get to those, but I'm, I'm disappointed, but we'll send you those questions. I'm glad we were able to get those, you were able to get them sorted out so we could talk to each other at least though, so thank you. Yeah. Um, you back on. Yeah. Right, right, definitely. So next week, um, we're going to be having Grace Gao as our guest, professor of ethics from Claremont School of Theology, co-director of the Center for Sexuality, Gender and Religion, and the author of Grounding Human Rights in a Pluralist World. You can help us bring the arts to life at Grace with a gift to the forum. Please visit gracecathedral.org backslash give to grace. And Joel, I'm just so, it's such a blessing to see you and just even hearing your, your, your take on things. It's just, it's such a breath of fresh air. Thank you so much for making time for us tonight. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your careful scholarship. We're, we're blessed. I really enjoyed talking to you too, Malcolm. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see you. Yeah. Yes. Take care. And I look forward to when we can see each other again in person. You too. And good night to everyone who's watching. Thank you.